Heavy seats, heavy seats. We're so blessed, amen, uh, to be able to hear from one of our best, most favorite preachers here at The Way. It's been, wow, a couple months, a few months, I don't know. Amen. We've had all kind of guest speakers in one service, and so the benefit of two services is we get to hear from, amen, all of our preachers in a little more regular uh, case, and so, so glad uh, for all the many ways that Pastor Erna blesses our church. Don't y'all love Pastor Erna? Amen. Ain't she all right? Amen. And so she is going to come and be our spokeswoman for the King of Glory today. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I still want you to stand to your feet and treat her like this is her first time preaching. And let's encourage her in the name of the Lord. Clap your hands. Stand up, everybody. Let's welcome Pastor Ernest. She comes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that, the way, fam. That's very kind. That's very kind. I'm so glad to be with you. I spent the weekend in Livermore. I was asked to come out and uh, do a couple seminars at a women's conference that was happening out there. And I love visiting other churches. But then it always makes me be like, I can't wait to get back to the way because I love us. I love being in this community and this family. Um, I also want to say hi to a friend. My friend Joyce is visiting. Joyce just moved here to be assistant professor at Pacific School of Religion. Hello, uh, fancy people that I know. Um, I think it's, I love what she did with her uh, dissertation work because she used to be the director of a woman, uh, home for women in crisis pregnancy. And then she did her PhD work around Mary. It said, reimagining Mary, a missiological approach to teen moms. So using her academia to uplift the story of the women that she had been working with. I'm super excited that she's local and thanks for visiting us today. Plus, I love to see, you know, a woman of color in academia, especially in seminaries. Yes, Jesus. So uh, I, I actually thought I was going to use the, the content that I had been using at the conference this weekend, right? Because I was like, why write a new sermon when I was just giving this sermon? And uh, I, had started some, I had started out of the lectionary in midweek. And then when I went to this conference, I was like, no, I'll just use that. And when I got home last night, the Lord was like, no, that's not the word I have for the way. I need you to go back to that lectionary sermon that you started in the middle of the week. And I was like, who are you talking to right now, Lord? I, I'm very tired. And he was like, I am speaking unto you. No, that's not how he talks. So, but I felt like what that confirmed for me then is he has something specific for us, for us this morning at 9 a.m. out of this particular scripture. So can we listen like that? Like he, he was like, no, not that word over there. This one from Psalm 139 is for this group this morning. So I'm going to read from the message version. And this is just such a great and beautiful psalm. It says, God, investigate my life. Get all the facts firsthand. I'm an open book to you. Even from a distance, you know what I'm thinking. You know when I leave and when I get back. I'm never out of your sight. You know everything I'm going to say before I start the first sentence. I look behind me, you're there. Then up ahead, you're there too. Your reassuring presence, coming and going. It's just too wonderful. I can't take it in. And then I just love, it's like, this is like, um, have you ever had like an extroverted processor where someone's, this, I feel like that's what the psalm writer is doing. Just like, is there any place I can go to avoid your spirit to be out of your sight? I could climb up to the sky. You're there. If I go underground, you're there. If I flew on morning wings to the far western horizon, you'd find me in a minute. You're already there waiting. Then I said to myself, he even sees me in the dark. At night, I'm immersed in light. In fact, darkness isn't dark to you. Night and day, darkness and light, they're all the same to you. You shaped me, first inside, then out. You formed me in my mother's womb. I thank you, high God. You're breathtaking. Body and soul, I'm marvelously made. I worship in adoration. What a creation. You know me inside and out. You know every bone in my body. You know exactly how I was made, bit by bit. How I was sculpted from nothing into something. Like an open book, you watched me grow from conception to birth. All the stages of my life were spread out before you. The days of my life, all prepared. Before I even lived one day, your thoughts, how rare, how beautiful. I'll never comprehend them. I couldn't even begin to count them. And more than that, I can, more than I can count the sand of the sea. Let me rise in the morning and live always with you. Amen? 
Amen. This is such an amazing and interesting and beautiful section of scripture. I feel like the writer is having this sort of out of body experience, right? Like, God, God, you're amazing. The stuff you make is amazing. Wait, I'm one of the stuff that you made. I'm amazing. You're beautiful. I'm beautiful. You're awe inspiring. I'm awe inspiring. Like, you, everything you make is so beautifully put together. I'm one of the things you made. I'm beautifully put together, right? Like, this just emoting. But what's so interesting about it is like he's emoting over the fact that he's a beautiful creation of God. And I just have to note that, right, we, we don't know who wrote all of the Psalms. Many of them are attributed to David. And I like to think that the author is a man. Because I think sometimes when we talk about like positive self-talk, we're like, that is the sphere of women. But this is a brother who is like, man, I'm just amazingly made. And he is emoting this. This is something that men and women, all of us as children of God, need to bask in, to sit in. And so I want to talk about that, because sometimes when we talk about, like, God made me, God knows me, everywhere I go, we say it in sort of a dismissive way, like, yeah, 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 God knows everything. Like, it's not wonderful. Do you know what I mean? It's just sort of like, yes, he knows where I am. Maybe in sort of a, like, police keeping kind of, you know, like, in a sort of, like, your parent watching you kind of way. It doesn't feel like, ah, he's everywhere I go. Sometimes we're like, I wish he wasn't everywhere I went. (laughs) Like, mm hmm don't be knowing my browser history. Like, we don't want him to, like, go everywhere that we went. But it's supposed to be this beautiful thing because if you have someone who really loves you and enjoys you and delights in you, like, I I experience this when I go home in a special way, right? Um, My mom uh, and my stepdad, so my stepdad runs a restaurant, so he's a cook, and I have these very specific Korean dishes that I love. And when I come home, I 100% of the time, my mom lives up near Seattle, know that those dishes will be made and sitting on the stove. They'll be sitting on the stove outside because Korean food has like a particular smell, so we have like an outside stove to like cook those foods. But, and even if they're working at the restaurant late, I know that they made it the day before and left it on there for me because they know me and they love me, right? And there's this enjoy. So when I walk into my mom's house, I feel enjoyed and delighted in, right, right from the beginning, from the things they do. And that's how it is with God. It's not like his, it's it's patrolling us, but it's this delight and enjoyment. And I felt like the word for us is, are we leaning into experiencing God in this way? Or are we just sort of like, hmm, that's that's an interesting truth for other people to know. Or are we really letting it soak into our souls? So I want you to just do a quick little mental exercise. All right, can we just do a little? All right, turn to a neighbor. I want you to have someone to talk to. And I want you to tell your neighbor, all right, pick your person, and then I'll give you what to do. So does everyone have a person they're talking to? What's the first word that your best friend would use to describe you? All right, give them what, like, what's, just, what do you think, well, your best friend, all right? Tell your neighbor a word you think your best friend would use to describe you. All right, what do you think is one of the first words that when you haven't been acting out of pocket, your mom would use to describe you to somebody else? Your mom. Now, what's the first word you think God uses to describe you? True to your gut. True to your gut, what do you think is the first word that comes to mind when you think how God will describe you? So I'm curious, was there, does, does anyone want to throw out some of the words that they feel like God might use when he describes you? Maybe a little selfish. <laughs> All right. That's honest. I appreciate that. Good. What else? What were some of the other words? Sorry? Empathetic? Empathetic or apathetic? Empathetic. (laughs) Excellent. Caring. Caring. Talented. Talented. Right. Yeah. Special. Special. I love that. So I think we have like a mix. It's like some of us think like the first thing God might say is like maybe a little critique of us. (laughs) Right? Does anyone, anyone feel like maybe the Lord might, his first word might be a skadoosh critique? And um, does anyone else, but others of us feel like, no, God might have like a a positive word for us. 
What this psalm challenges me to think is, rarely do I imagine that God is just emoting over me like I am very wonderful. Because I think sometimes we think that's going to be egotistical, but I actually think it's, we need to be anchored in this. Because this is, like this, uh, in Psalm 139, in the NIV translation, it says, um, I'm going to skip forward. It says, you've created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. And so what is ha his logic here is basically your creator God and the things you create are wonderful. And I'm one of the beings that you've created. So by extension, I am very wonderful. And I am very beautiful. And we need to know this. How many of you all day long in your mind say, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made? How many of you say more anxious and negative thoughts about yourself? So come with me, right? Come with me. I wonder how he got this way, right? The word fearfully and wonderfully, it's like the root of it is to revere. Like you're so amazing, you kind of scare me. Your power kind of overwhelms me. We're not a culture that's filled with a ton of awe, right? We're kind of an informal culture. So I was trying to think of like, where have I experienced awe in my life? And about 20 years ago, me and a friend of mine decided to go on a road trip and we were super broke and we decided we would go through Arizona, down through Mexico and then come back up on, on when we had a couple of days off. We borrowed a tent, which we, that's how broke we were, we had to borrow a tent and we didn't set it up before we went and the first night when we set it up, we realized it was like, four feet long, so there was no way to lay in the tent like fully extended. You had to be, I was like, this is a sad little trip we're on, but here we go. And we went to, um, <clears throat> we went to the Grand Canyon. Now I've seen the Grand Canyon in photographs and in movies, and so I thought I knew what to expect. How many of you have ever seen the Grand Canyon? Like in for real, like in your own personhood. <laughs> um, when I came around the corner, and I saw it for the first time, truly I can say my breath caught. Uh, it's so vast and so deep and so far. It does something to the way like sound hangs in the air because there's just such a giant space. It feels like sound is sort of absorbed. And coming to the edge of it and looking, I felt awe, like something profound and powerful and amazing created this space. And that sense of awe is what this writer is experiencing about themselves. I'm an awe-inspiring creation. I know even as I say it, we have a little bit of resistance inside. I know some of us are saying like, oh, but you don't know what my parenting is like. You don't know like what some of my relationships have been like. You don't know the struggle bus of my credit history. <laughs> and I feel like God is saying, that's not the first list of words I see or say. Because I made you. I, I made you. And so I want to look into this image a little bit. It says, I knit you together, right? You put me together, you knit me together. So I pulled up this picture of a person knitting because I thought that might help us. I really like this. What I like about it is to knit something, you have to look at it, right? Nobody's like knit, like project managing knitting from a distance. Knitting is this personal thing that you do. And you can't like knit and look away and I rarely have seen someone knitting with hatred towards the object of their knitting, <laughs> right? Knitting is this, it's this stitch by stitch, intimate, personal. Nobody knits because it, it's typically, right, we associate with people who want to make a very personalized gift to give to someone. So as they're doing it, they're thinking about the person they're going to give it to. When God says you're, he knits you together, it means piece by piece, 
he was looking at you and thinking about you and all the weird little goofy things about your personality he's not like mm, pull it together Christians need to be a little like right in the middle of this lane he's like that little weird thing about you I put that there stitched it right on in you know that like really nerdy thing about you stitched it right on in right that like that thing that you think is funny but no one else thinks is funny it's like stitched it right on in you know that thing that you're passionate about stitched it right on in the way your creativity exists in this world he paused for a minute he was like Oh yeah, I'm gonna stitch that right on in. You know, that, that thing that other people don't think is like that delightful about you, stitched it right on in. He likes you. He made you this way. I think sometimes because we know that sin is in this world, we think that everything about us is like sinful and then God's like, oh, I wish I could just fix everything about you. But actually I think we need to start from a place of I knit you together. Yes. Now, you wandered around this world and got tugged on some of them their strings, and we're going to need to mend that up. But I don't begin with looking at you as fundamentally flawed. I begin by looking at you as this beautiful creation of mine that I knit together. So I want us to lean into that. You're not an accident. You didn't just end up here. I don't really care how your mom and dad put that situation together, intentional, well thought out, or surprise. But God put you together, knit you together. I think we need to think about this intentionally um, because the things we think about ourselves are really important. Um, I, I'm going to be on. I'm be honest. I'm be honest with you. So uh, anxiety is a part of my life. I think I carry some like intergenerational trauma. I think my mom, just with her immigrant experience, I would, from the womb carried anxiety. You know, when like my mom came over here to the United States, um, she had quit school. She had to not quit school. She had to drop out of school because they didn't have money in eighth grade. She was working from then. Um, she had been in love with somebody but couldn't get married because her family was too poor, so his family wouldn't let them get married. That kind of stuff is very important culturally at that time. She married my dad, who was over 30 years older than her because she needed to come to America. She needed to get out of her country. And when she came here, the, my dad worked on a ship, and so she, they were here together for a couple months, and then he left for six months, and she was alone here, hardly speaking English, no family. Do you know how much like trauma and anxiety that causes? She talks about going to the grocery store and people yelling at her to go back to Vietnam. Just, a, it was isolated in tough times. So when, when she, w I just know that when, from when I came into this world, thank you therapy, from the beginning, I think that anxiety has been in my body. And you know, it's, you know how anxiety feels in your stomach? I think that's what it set up like kind of a weird relationship with food because food was the thing that would like silence that feeling in my stomach. Then when 2013 and 2014 came along and my work around like race stuff increased, the trauma increased and it triggered like an increase in anxiety. And what I had just held in my body moved into like anxious train of thought. And so I would just like get like a negative thought in my head and then it would like set up camp and it would be like, let's put this thought on loop. And I didn't understand that that was anxiety. I didn't understand that that was part of mental health. Thank you, therapy. Yeah. Thank you, my therapist. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I was like, I'd bring a whole village around myself. Like, I love Jesus. I love my therapist. I love my spiritual director. I love my squad where I can text them and write. Everything is the village of support to exist. But what anxiety taught me was I have to be so careful the thoughts I let run around in my mind. Because my discipline now is the moment I identify one of those, those thoughts that I'm going to start to chew on, I have to stop it because it will derail me. But I used to be more casual about the thoughts I let run around in my head. And I think sometimes we're casual about the negative thoughts we let run around in our head. Like they're not a big deal because it's fine to say mean things about myself. Stuff you would never say about anybody else, you say about yourself in your own mind. And I feel like this scripture is not just a, a, like a nice psalm to pass over, but I want to challenge us to constantly find a way in our minds to live in the reality that 
You are wonderfully made, knit together on purpose. God looks at you like this. I'm thinking to myself, how did the psalmist learn to think about himself like this? And I was like, God had to teach him, right? He must have heard God talk about him like this, and so that's how he talks about himself. So there's a video I saw on the internet a while back, and I want to play it for us because I think it's such a great example of uh, how God talks about us is how we should talk about ourselves. I love it. I... I love it. Um, can we go to the still? I put. I did a screen capture of. Uh, can we go forward to the picture of them? Okay. What I love about this picture, right? They're looking in a mirror, right? If you figure out what's going on, and if you look where she's looking, she's looking in the mirror to look at him, to see how he's looking at her. I. She's learning how to talk about herself, because of how her father is teaching her to talk about herself. Are you letting God teach you how to talk about yourself? Are the words that you're rehearsing in your mind the words that God has given you to say about yourself? Are they the words that scripture has given you to say about yourself? Or are they the words, some of us come from dysfunctional families, are they the words that your broken family gave you? Are they the words that society is trying to give you? Are they the words that that like messed up supervisor at your job is trying to give you? Are they even just the messed up words of siblings in your life, people you thought were, are those words? Those are not the, don't let those people teach you what to say about yourself. I want you, that's what scripture is supposed to give us. It's this mirror where we can hear God say to us and we can look in the mirror and see him looking at us. And he says, just like that, repeat my words. What am I saying about you? This psalmist is reveling in what he knows God has said about himself and about him as his creation. You are very good, so I am very good. You make beautiful things, so I'm a beautiful thing. You make awe-inspiring creations. I'm an awe-inspiring creation. We need to be intentional about running that script. It won't make you a self-absorbed person. It will actually make you very, very generous towards other people. Because as you begin to sit in that for yourself, you can begin to look for it in other people. I actually think the root of like justice work is being rooted in the fact that you are made in the image of God and never, never allowing anyone else to be treated like they are not fully in the image of God. And basically like every ism and every like issue that we can think about in society is basically a pivot from we are all making, we are all made in the image of God to like let's create a hierarchy that ranks people's image of Godness. White supremacy is like, let's rank them racially. Uh, white people most in the image of God. Let's say Native American people don't exist at all. Let's put bla anti-blackness into everything. Asian people, if you agree to white supremacy, we'll let you be the model minority. Is the ranking system good? Right? That's a, that ranking system exists to say more in the image of God, less in the image of God. And when we fight for justice, we say, I, ref I, I reject that. I reject that structure. You know, patriarchy is saying, and the church is very deeply rooted in this, men are more in the image of God than women. And when we say, no, men and women made in the image of God. Not women are made, ah, it's skadoosh less in the image of God. And all the magical leadership powers are given to men and women are there to bring the snacks. I just came from a woman's conference and we just talked a lot about how people try to relegate us to the ministry of snacks and doilies. <laughs> Homophobia is basically saying, if I'm straight, I'm more in the image of God. Colonialism, xenophobia is basically saying, if you're from my country, you're more in the image of God. And it's believing stuff like that that makes us feel good about literally we run baby prisons in our country right now. Prisons 
for babies. Because we think babies from other countries are slightly less in the image of God. Colorism, ranking people on the, right? Just degree. We always were trying to move to these toxic hierarchies, and we don't like them when we're lower on the hierarchy, right? Like if you're on the bottom of the hierarchy, you, you, it's easy to convince yourself you're like, mm, that's a problematic hierarchy. But then don't we see all the subtle ways we also rank people? Like, ooh, I don't like these people. Oh, that person thinks they're better than me because they're rich. But then you see this homeless person over here and you feel like it's okay to treat them like they are less fully in the image of God. A radical commitment to never give in to these hierarchies is justice, is the kingdom of God, is the beloved community, is radical to just resist all these hierarchies. One of the, way, one of the things that has helped me um, to think about getting outside of some of these hierarchies is uh, in my program, um, some of my Lakota fam, so my program was a lot of Native American and indigenous folks, so my Lakota fam taught me a phrase in their language, um, which I think I'm gonna say slightly wrong, but it, it's mitakie oyasi, which means all my relations or we are all related. And uh, included in the family of relation is also creation, right? Like we're in relationship with creation. Because another toxic hierarchy, another problematic application of Genesis 1 is people came out of Genesis 1 and was like, we are in dominion over creation. It's under us, we consume it, we can just use it up for our purposes. Right? And that's a toxic hierarchy. I don't think that's how God intended it. I think that if you look at how the garden is created, I think they're meant to be in relationship with each other. And so as a worldview that says we're also in relationship with creation, and it's responsible for us, and we're responsible for it. But you hear even in our language, like we're so deeply embedded in hierarchies, we don't call creation creation or a relative, we call it a natural resource. And think about what's inside that. If it's a resource, what are you supposed to do with resources? Resources exist for you to consume and use up. If we call creation a natural resource, fundamentally in our language, we view it a certain way, as something to consume. All those hierarchies about people, too, make us see them as something we can consume and use for our benefit. And if we want to erase this, all my relations, is a powerful correction to that. I didn't realize how much um, all this hierarchy is, was uh, embedded in our language. I'm gonna do like a tiny little academic aside, but I'll make it accessible. Can we do that? Can we go like nerd back to not nerd, all right? But the, the thing that really challenged me was I read this article, and I, I've, I've shared this with some of you before, but man, it just messed me up. So there was this article where this, um, I'll read the abstract. Okay, abstracts are very nerdy, but stay with me. I put it up here, so let's, uh, so this is a Muskogee uh, teacher. He goes, engaging critical analysis of Muskogee language in its pre-colonial context reveals how one cannot articulate ownership over another species. Linguistic imperialism, however, is one ideologically transformative settler colonial mechanism whereby the traditional Muskogee inability to conceptualize ownership over human bodies gets inverted, allowing for the adoption of both institutionalized servitude and impor importation of structural racism into Muskogee society. I argue here that such anti-black language and subjugation of blackness infiltrated Muskogee people through bilingual and monolingual English-speaking Muskogee persons. Moreover, blackness is integral agential energy in traditional medicinal practices. Therefore, disparagement of blackness in its human and corresponding cosmological forms leads to weakening medicinal efficacy. What he's basically saying here is, before colonialism, our language couldn't hold the concept of owning other people and placing them in hierarchies that are required in order for anti-blackness and racism to exist. Their language literally couldn't hold it. And the anecdote he tells is that he and other folks who all teach their traditional language were talking, right, so they're all like Muskogee language teachers, and they, uh, they were talking about some of the history between uh, black folks who had become free 
uh, still in the era of slavery, who had then kind of integrated into their tribal community. And he said in the course of the conversation, like some anti-blackness came up. And he said, I want us to switch this conversation from English into our tr traditional language. And he said they couldn't do it because they literally couldn't have an anti-black conversation in Muskogee. And I was like, what? That our language and our worldviews, even the, the language we speak carries all these hierarchical assumptions. Yeah. And we don't even know it. Yeah. Like when you think about capitalizing the letter I, how much you're elevating the individual. Like why not capitalize we? Why not capitalize you? I. In our language is all these toxic hierarchies. And so we need to lean into other communities that can show us how to get liberated from the, some of this colonizing mindset. Amen? And so that's why I'm grateful for and will always be amplifying like my indigenous brothers and sisters because I think they have a lot to teach us in this way. So I just want to go back and... Um, just close with an invitation for us to deeply internalize the word. I asked us, you know, what word do you think your best friend would use? What, what word would your mom use? And what word do you think God would use? To, to leave here saying to ourselves these beloved words that God is speaking to us. To look into the mirror and look at how God is looking at us so we know how to look at ourselves. And just like this father... What I love is he's not just saying it. It would be totally different if she was standing there and he was standing a couple feet away and he was like, who are you? What's your name? Who are you in this world, right? But I think part of it is the beautiful proximity, right? That's like, it's so intimate. The way his hands are on her and around her and how like happy and safe she feels, that is the invitation for us. As people who walk with Jesus, I'm not worried about the way, like, in, you know, suggesting to you guys, like, hey, guys, you know that people who follow Jesus should care about justice? I don't feel like I have to win that argument. I feel like what I need to say is, do you know that part of your radical pursuit of justice is a radical belief in your fearfully and wonderfully madeness? That pursuing justice isn't just out here, but it is also in here. And to lean into that and to resist the colonizing lies where we submit to any of these hierarchies. And so I want us to just spend a little time letting Jesus minister to us in that. I actually thought the song we sang in worship was perfect. And so I want to go back to that and just let God minister to us. I want you to give to God. I just, repenting is basically saying like, I've been going and doing it this way and I'm not gonna do it that way anymore. And I think some of us need to repent of saying like, yes, I've led a bunch of lies about who I am and where I fall in these like hierarchies, sometimes better than others, sometimes worse, I need to stop, stop doing that. I repent of that. Some of us have felt like we just don't deserve to be as radically loved as God wants to love us. And I just wanna say, we, that's what's beautiful about following Jesus, radical love. I just want to pray for folks who feel like the tape that runs in your head is stuff that e one of your parents said to you. So I think that's one of the deepest things to change, to let God's words replace negative words that your parents might have said, or even just the absence, right? Our parents, we need our parents to be as generous as this father was. And if we didn't have that, then we need to seek God for that. So I just specifically want to pray for those of you who, as you're listening, you're like, uh, but I keep hearing some of these negative things that my parents said. Can we? I want to pray for you. So just put your hands out or stand up. Let me pray for those of you who feel like some of the negative tapes in your mind come from your parents, all right? And I know that's vulnerable, but let's put that out there. So put your hands out and let me pray for you. In the name of Jesus, God, would you silence and break the power of these words from parents, God, where there was verbal abuse, where there was just an absence of affection, come in the name of Jesus. And I feel like to scoop them up, put them into a bag, tie them up and move them away, God. 
move them away in the name of Jesus and then let these beautiful words of yours come in I knit you together I looked at you and made you on purpose you exist on purpose you're my beautiful creation you are just like me you look like me you are in my image I love you I love you I see you I enjoy you I delight in you I'm proud of you I'm with you when you get up when you go to work when you come home when you're messing up when you're struggling when you're succeeding I'm with you I'm so proud of you you are an awe-inspiring creation of mine Jesus come in and minister that truth right into the souls of my brothers and sisters bind up those negative tapes God I just want us to stay in worship if the, where you are I don't want you to sit passively I want you to in your spirit being saying yes I am I am fearfully wonderfully made and if some of you want to be prayed for then I want you to be prayed for so I'll ask our ministers to come on up ask for our leaders to come on up to pray for folks higher and higher. you shaped me first inside then out you formed me in my mother's womb. I thank you, high God, your breathtaking body and soul. I'm marvelously made. I worship in adoration. What a creation. You know me inside and out. You know every bone in my body. You know exactly how I was made, bit by bit, how I was sculpted from nothing into something. Like an open book, you watched me grow from conception to birth. All the stages of my life were spread out before you. The days of my life all prepared before I'd even lived one day. Your thoughts, how rare, how beautiful. I'll never comprehend them. I couldn't even begin to count them. You've searched me, Lord. You know me. You created my inmost being. You knit me together. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Turn to your neighbor and say, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. That I really am. <laughs> I really am. Jesus, amen. Can we just thank God that this is our good and generous God? This is our good and generous God. This is our good and generous, beautiful, beloved God. Amen.